Liberal Viewer presents. So, welcome to the April 8th edition of Liberal Viewer Monday Media Mixup. Thanks for joining me and Cheech the Cat here. Uh, I'll be using the nine best, most newsworthy clips from the Sunday morning news analysis shows from the big five corporate outlets of ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, and Fox News, uh, the so called corporate media here in the United States corporate media here in the United States. Oh, and I have the, here's also Chong. We're, we're all here for the show. Um, actually, there's no NBC clips. Meet the Press was uh, preempted by world premiere soccer or whatever. Uh, and as my regular viewers know, it's just another example of how a journalistic program, Meet the Press, has a motto. If it's Sunday, it's Meet the Press, which is actually a lie, which doesn't seem like a good look for journalism, but what do I know? Uh, anyway, um, I picked out the nine clips for what should be really educational, informative, fair use, media criticism, and political commentary for uh, show for you all today. As you can see from the title of the video, my main topic is, Will killing se of seven world central kitchen workers in Gaza change U.S. policy? Uh, that was one of the things that happened in the Israel-Gaza uh, Israel war in Gaza this last week. Uh, celebrity chef Jose Andres has his uh, group World Central Kitchen that feeds people after disasters or in war zones. And uh, seven of them were killed in three vehicles in Gaza by the Israeli military drone strikes. Uh, I don't know why there have been like 200 aid workers killed, not to mention uh, 30 something thousand Palestinians, uh, but for some reason these seven people created a much greater media firestorm than any of the rest of that, um, and I'll be just discussing that as we go through the news summaries and the newsmaker clips, including uh, part of an interview that uh, Chef Jose Andres did on ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos, uh, with the host this week, Martha Raditz, and I'll get to all that uh, in just a couple minutes, but first for my political comedy clip, I it's off topic. It's not, I don't think they even covered the Israel-Gaza war on Saturday Night Live, but there was this one joke from Weekend Update that referenced a clip of Donald Trump that I talked about a few weeks ago, but I never actually showed you the clip. I just kind of described it to you, and I felt bad about not showing the clip, and I saw it showed up on Weekend Update, and a pretty good joke, so uh, I'm going to start the show with that political comedy and talk about it with you a little more after we watch it together over here. In a new interview, Donald Trump also claimed that President Biden was high on cocaine <laughs> during the State of the Union, saying he was all jacked up at the beginning. By the end, he was fading fast. <laughs> huh, it almost sounds like Donald Trump knows exactly what it feels like to be on cocaine. You know, like at the beginning, you've got a lot of energy. <laughs> But then, by the end, you're fading fast. Just recently heard that Saudi Arabia and Russia will repeat your... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know if that's the explanation for that weird Trump clip I talked about uh, a few weeks ago, but I think that uh, the point of that and what I was talking about a few weeks ago is that the Republicans who keep attacking... Biden for being old and uh, not mentally competent uh, have uh, some definite uh, pot calling the kettle black problems uh, with Trump, who is often incoherent and makes a lot of mistakes. And I don't know what that was in that uh, clip that I talked about a few weeks ago and you just saw there. Uh, was it uh, cocaine or some people say he snorts Adderall or who knows, who knows what is going on. But somehow I don't think Biden is a cocaine user, but you can let me know what you think in the comment section. And now I'm going to get to the news summaries from longest to shortest. Uh, there are only four because like I said, no meet the press this week. And the longest one was Fox News Sunday, uh, guest host this week was Martha McCallum, and they had on uh, Trey Yinks from Tel Aviv and Lucas Tomlinson from the White House, 
all covering what happened, the Israel-Gaza war uh, from Trey Yinkst, and then the Biden administration political reaction from the White House with Lucas Tomlinson. You notice they never mention World Central Kitchen, which was only mentioned briefly by the one person on the left in the panel discussion, Juan Williams, which I will get to. That's clip nine, by the way, down in the video description under media mentioned, I put uh, short summaries of all nine clips and you can see that's going to be the ninth clip. Uh, but now let's get to clip two here, Fox News Sunday. They mentioned seven aid workers killed in Gaza, but that's a, a really weird way to put it because uh, there have been like 200 aid workers killed in Gaza. These were special because there was one uh, American slash Canadian amongst the seven. And Jose Andres is kind of a celebrity chef. There's like a celebrity aspect to it. I don't know. I saw in the live comments uh, that uh, Zed Alpha was saying it's because they're white. But I, I think it might be the celebrity aspect. But uh, maybe it's some combination. Anyway, uh, there's some other problems with this Fox News Sunday News Summary when you compare it to the other three. They don't talk about the protests in Israel. I wonder why. Uh, anyway, I'll talk about all of that a little more after we watch this longest news summary together over here. Hello from Fox News in Washington. Good morning, everybody. We begin with a Fox News alert. Israel has announced a major ground troop withdrawal from southern Gaza. This comes six months to the day after Hamas's brutal terror attacks in Israel on October the 7th, which was the beginning of the war in Gaza. So in a moment, we will get reaction from Delaware Senator Chris Coons, who is on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. But first, team coverage with Lucas Tomlinson at the White House and Trey Yinks in Tel Aviv, Israel. Trey, let's begin with you. Martha, good morning. It's been six months since the October 7th massacre known as Black Saturday. And this morning, Israel announced it's withdrawn all troops from southern Gaza. There is just one brigade of Israeli soldiers left in Gaza at the moment. And we do understand this force will be used to secure a supply line. There are additional operations that are expected to take place, including targeted raids that could happen in the future. The announcement today clearly marks the next phase of this war and could be an indication that ceasefire talks are headed in the right direction. Looking back at the past 184 days, the numbers are staggering. Around 1,200 people in Israel were killed in a surprise attack on October 7th. More than 250 were taken hostage, including Hen Goldstein Almog. What's going through your mind in that moment? Terrible fear, fright and shock. We got out in a line, the boys were already going out, and then Yam followed. Before that, one of the terrorists saw Yam's uniform shirt. He opened it like that. I remember his big green eyes, and he screamed at me in Arabic, and I don't understand what he's asking me. After the massacre and hostage taking, the Israeli air and ground campaign in response left around 33,000 people dead, according to the Palestinian Health Ministry. Israel does not dispute those numbers, but says more than a third of the Gazans killed are militants from Hamas or Islamic Jihad. The war between Israel and Hamas is the longest in the country's history, and at the six month mark, Israel is bracing for the possibility of a larger regional conflict. Martha? Trey, thank you very much. Now let's go to Lucas Tomlinson at the White House covering the Biden administration and their reaction. Hi, Lucas. Martha, it appears the threats from President Biden worked. In his call with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, Biden demanded an immediate ceasefire and changes to how Israel conducts its war in Gaza. Did he threaten to stop military aid to Israel? I asked him to do what they're doing. Biden called the situation in Gaza unacceptable and demanded Israel do more to protect civilians and deliver more aid while battling Hamas. Biden said his red line was Israeli forces launching an assault on Rafah. Some Democratic lawmakers said any large-scale military action there would force them to condition aid to Israel. A spokesman for Biden described the recent conversations between leaders. Too many civilians have been killed. Um, and if we don't see those changes, well, then we're going to have to make some changes and decisions of our own. 
A botched Israeli drone strike Monday night seemed to mark a tipping point with America's closest ally in the Middle East. Seven aid workers were killed, including an American. A similar drone strike by the U.S. military in Afghanistan during the withdrawal killed 10 civilians, including seven children. No one was punished. John Kirby downplayed the comparison. These are events that happened three years apart, two different uh, geographic locations, two different countries, two different sets of circumstances. Israeli forces also carried out an airstrike in Syria last week, killing a top Iranian Quds Force commander. Iran has vowed revenge, putting U.S. and Israeli forces in the region on high alert. Over 100 hostages remain in captivity in Gaza. Tomorrow, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan plans to meet with the families of some of them here at the White House. Martha. Thank you, Lucas. Lucas Tomlinson reporting from the White House. Joining me now, Delaware Senator and the Biden campaign's national co-chair, Chris Coons. And yeah, like I said, uh, oh, I'm not going to show a clip of the Chris Coons interview, the uh, World Central Kitchen workers killed did not come up in that interview. Uh, you saw they mentioned that there were seven aid workers killed. One American didn't mention World Central Central Kitchen or celebrity chef Jose Andres at all. And uh, you also notice they immediately talked about how, you know, the United States has killed civilians too. The Biden administration uh, in uh, retaliation for uh, the attack that killed 13 soldiers during the uh, withdrawal from Afghanistan. They botched a retaliation and ended up killing 10 civilians, including uh, seven children. Uh, and that seems to be like really uh, an important counterpoint that they bring up. Like every time this comes up, you know, not that it comes up very much on Fox News anyway. And you'll see that uh, when I get to my final clip, the panel discussion, when Juan Williams finally brings up World Central Kitchen, Martha McCallum, the host, immediately pushes back with that. Well, the U.S. kills civilians, too. Like, that makes it okay? Like, it's kind of a strange count. It, I mean, I guess it's whataboutism uh, at, it, at its uh, worst, in a way. But uh, like I said, the one of the other problems with that uh, new summary is they, they are always talking about the protests in the United States against uh, U.S. support of Israel, but they never mention the protests in Israel about what's going on, which uh, comes up in some of the other news summaries here. Uh, the next one's from CBS News Face the Nation, Margaret Brennan and Holly Williams. This is more than a minute shorter, but somehow they find time to mention the protests in Israel over here. Good morning and welcome to Face the Nation. There is breaking news this morning. We are seeing some significant developments out of Israel. The IDF has pulled some forces out of southern Gaza and Prime Minister Netanyahu said they are one step away from victory. The Israelis will also send a delegation to Cairo to meet with CIA Director Bill Burns and Qatari and Egyptian officials to try to negotiate both a ceasefire and to get the more than 130 hostages believed to be held by Hamas. Six months into the war, the Israeli military says they've eliminated 12,000 terrorists in Gaza, but at the expense of thousands of Palestinian lives. The Gaza Health Ministry reports more than 33 thousand Palestinians have been killed. The aid organization Save the Children cites the number of children killed in Gaza at 14,000. We'll hear from their president later in the broadcast. We begin with our Holly Williams, who's in Tel Aviv. Holly, what can you tell us about these developments and their significance? Good morning, Margaret. Well, Israel's military says it now only has one division inside the Gaza Strip. The other division that was there has left in the last 24 hours. The remaining troops are all either along Gaza's border with Israel or north of an east-west road uh, that bisects the Gaza Strip. The Israelis built that road recently, it's thought, as part of their planning for the day after the war. Now, I spoke with a, an Israeli military spokesman a short while ago who told me that this is a quote, evolution of the war effort and not a partial withdrawal. He would not give me any exact troop numbers. My colleague, CBS News producer Marwan Al Ghul is in southern Gaza and he says it is now possible to move freely from southern Gaza all the way up to central Gaza and that has not been possible for the past three months. 
Holly, there's also a lot of political pressure within Israel right now and these ongoing protests against the Netanyahu government. How is that affecting things? Well, Margaret, we actually just heard from Prime Minister Netanyahu a short while ago uh, ahead of a cabinet meeting here in Israel. He didn't uh, mention this troop movement at all. In fact, he vowed that Israel would fight for total victory. But he is under enormous pressure. Just as this news came out about these troops leaving Gaza, there's also pressure from the right wing on Netanyahu not to give away too much to Hamas in negotiations. And then on the other side of the political spectrum, last night across Israel, tens of thousands of people took part in anti-government protests. Many people here are angry with the government, with their own leaders, for not doing more to bring the remaining hostages home. And here in Tel Aviv, a car rammed into a group of protesters, injuring several people. And opposition leader Yair Lapid said that the incident was, quote, the direct result of rising incitement from the government. So more criticism there for Benjamin Netanyahu. Margaret. Holly Williams in Tel Aviv, thank you. And we turn now to John Kirby. He is the coordinator for strategic. And I actually do have a, a pretty good interview. Uh, some of the interview of John Kirby by Margaret Brennan on Face the Nation, where she asks about the killing of the uh, World Central Kitchen workers, as well as uh, the greater... A look at how Israel's conducting its war in Gaza and how uh, or whether they're violating international law in questions that should be asked more often. And I think, like I said, you saw that uh, you saw that CBS News Face the Nation talked about the opposition to Bibi Netanyahu in Israel. That somehow didn't make it into the Fox News Sunday news summary, even though they had two different reporters and an, an extra minute. That didn't come up. The 14,000 Palestinian children killed did not come up, uh, though they mentioned the seven children that the U.S. killed, but not the 14,000 children killed by Israel in Gaza. Uh, so there's that. And uh, I have two more news summaries. Uh, the next one is ABC's This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Martha Raddatz does a under two-minute news summary that focuses a lot more on the killing of the seven World Central Kitchen workers because they had their exclusive guest, Chef Jose Andres, on the program. Uh, that's going to be the first newsmaker clip I show you after these two news summaries. But anyway, here's how ABC covered uh, the same topic uh, yesterday over here. Good morning and welcome to this week. Today marks six months of war in Gaza, six months since the horror of October 7th and the deadly terror attack on Israel that killed more than 1,200 Israelis with more than 100 hostages still believed to be held by Hamas. It's also been six months of Israel's devastating response, causing widespread destruction across Gaza and taking the lives of more than 33,000 Palestinians, according to the Hamas-run health ministry, and leaving the territory on what the UN has called the brink of famine. But it was the loss of seven aid workers this week that seemed to galvanize a new level of outrage. These seven individuals from around the world, including one dual American Canadian citizen, working with the relief group World Central Kitchen, killed by repeated drone strikes of their clearly marked convoy, despite the group having coordinated their location and movements with the IDF. World Central Kitchen was founded by renowned chef turned philanthropist Jose Andres, his organization providing meals around the globe in the most dire circumstances, from the aftermath of natural disasters like earthquakes and hurricanes, to war zones from Ukraine to Gaza, where World Central Kitchen has served millions of meals to Palestinians. That work now paused after the attack that Israel admits was a grave mistake. So I sat down with Chef Jose Andres to discuss his emotional response to the death of his colleagues and what he believes both the Israeli and U.S. government should be doing to address this war's deadly toll. And uh, in just a minute, I will have about uh, I'll have a significant part of that interview uh, to show you and to talk to you about. Uh, and you can hear. Uh, Jose Andres, the celebrity chef, say that uh, Israel is uh, 
conducting a war on humanity. I guess killing humanitarian aid workers is kind of a war on humanity. And anyway, I'll talk about that when we get to that clip. But uh, I want to show the final news summary, the shortest. This is a little over 90 seconds. It's like a third of the length of the Fox News Sunday news summary. And yet somehow Jake Tapper finds time to mention the protests in Israel against Israeli policy. Uh, I don't know why that didn't make it to Fox News. I mean, I do. I mean, we all do. But I'll talk about that a little more after we watch the last news summary of the week together over here. Hello, I'm Jake Tapper in Washington, D.C., where the state of our union is frankly heartsick. News this morning out of Israel as the region marks six months since those brutal Hamas terrorist attacks on October 7th against Israel, killing 1,200 and taking more than 250 people hostages. The Israeli military now says it has withdrawn forces from the southern Gaza Strip, though, quote, significant force remains in other areas of Gaza. That, as an Israeli official told CNN this morning, that an Israeli delegation is expected to join hostage release and ceasefire negotiations in Cairo, Egypt. All of that as Israelis' anger over the roughly 100 hostages still in captivity spilled onto the streets of Israel last night. Demonstrators demanding the resignation of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu over his handling of the war and his failure, in their view, to sufficiently focus on bringing those hostages home. Meanwhile, in Gaza, the brutal toll continues in the Israel Defense Forces war against Hamas, which embeds within the populace. Israeli attacks have resulted in the deaths and injuries of tens of thousands of innocent Palestinians. And aid organizations say all 2.2 million people in Gaza do not have enough to eat, with half the population on the brink of starvation. Here in the United States, the desperate conditions in Gaza and President Biden's support for Israel in the wake of the Hamas attacks have damaged his standing with his progressive coalition. And this week, President Biden raised the pressure on the Israeli government to allow more aid to enter Gaza. Joining us now is the chairman of the House Committee on Intelligence, Congressman Mike Turner. And I'm not going to show you a clip of Mike Turner. Uh, I'm going to show you a clip from... CNN State of the Union, where Jake Tapper talks to Cindy McCain, the wife of late Senator John McCain, who is a head of the World Food Program and who uh, has some interesting insights into what's necessary to get more food into Gaza. And I think you see there, uh, you also saw that uh, Jake Tapper mentioned that half the population of Gaza was on the brink of starvation. That's like a million people about to starve. That's something I've talked about uh, over the last weeks. And that's one of the reasons that World Central Kitchen and uh, was in there and why it's so important to allow these aid workers and food and medicine to get into Gaza. Uh, and also, like I said, uh, you saw that there were protests in Israel against Bibi Netanyahu calling for his resignation. Uh, that showed up in a couple of the news summaries, not the Fox News Sunday one. And I mean, in some ways, it doesn't even make sense that Fox News Sunday wouldn't show that. I, I mean, I know why they don't, because they want to show like the protests against Biden is like anti-Semitic and uh, irrational. And, uh, you know, it's not it's not supportive of Israel. And if they showed the protests in Israel against uh, Israel Israeli policy that would kind of undercut that argument. But actually, I think it makes Israel look uh, better, like more democratic. You, I mean, you don't see uh, Palestinians protesting in Gaza against Hamas uh, because it's Hamas was never really a liberal democratic government. It was like barely elected and uh, did not run Gaza in a, you know, I think it was... There was an election that uh, Hamas won in the in Gaza. What was it in two thousand fourteen? I think, and uh, since then, no more elections and uh, not a lot of uh, freedoms from the Hamas government in Gaza. Uh, I mean, is anyone a fan of Hamas? I, I don't think anyone's a fan of Hamas. There are people who support the rights of Palestinians, uh, but I hope. That's not the same thing as supporting Hamas, despite what you hear on Fox News all the time. And anyway, the next clips, the next four clips are the newsmaker clips. Uh, it's going to be Jose Andres and then John Kirby, Cindy McCain, and then uh, the Juan Williams brief mention of World Central Kitchen 
on the only mention on Fox News Sunday that I promised would be at the end. Oh, before the bonus Cheech and Chong clip I filmed, or I, there's no film, but that I video recorded earlier. Uh, so stay tuned for that if that's something you want to see. But anyway, let me start with Chef Jose Andres, uh, who uh, is very passionate on this issue and very skeptical of what the Israelis are saying. And uh, especially the way the attack occurred, where they hit each of the three vehicles in succession. Uh, so it wasn't like one mistake. It was actually three mistakes. And as you saw in uh, one of those news summaries there, I think it was the CBS News Face the Nation one, they talked about how the World Central Kitchen aid workers had actually coordinated their movements with the Israeli military beforehand. And this still happened. And anyway, that that's all in this uh, interview here. I'm going to show you uh, about five and a half minutes of the interview and talk about it with you a little more after we watch it together over here. Initial report released Friday calling the drone strikes a grave mistake that should not have happened. Satisfied with that report? Well, I want to thank, obviously, the IBF uh, for doing such a quick investigation. But at the same time, I would say something so complicated, the investigation should be much more deeper. And I would say that the perpetrator cannot be investigating himself. But I would say we need more information. We need to see better quality videos. We need to be saying what was the conversations, the radio conversations between the different officers uh, and soldiers in charge of saying that those cars were a target because they were an imminent threat. Those weapons can only be used with very sophisticated drones. And we all know that those drones have high capabilities, day and night, with cameras that can see in very powerful way what's going on. That's one of the things that they said, is that they could not, because it was night, see the logo from World Central Kitchen, which was so clear on top of the vehicle. In the daytime, they said they couldn't see it at night. Do you buy that? Obviously, I would like to see high quality of the video, high quality of the images. I'm very sure that probably uh, those logos were visible. They were white cars. That logo is very colorful. Uh, even in a dark night, I guarantee you that those drones could be seen. They say that their drone video, and this has not been verified, this video, that they say shows Hamas operatives and they thought they one fired from an aid truck. Every time something happens, we cannot just be bringing Hamas into the question. I think IBF knows better than anybody that can be a better army. It should be protocols, it should be rules of engagement, that somebody has to be making sure that they happen in a war zone. Is way too many cases now of humanitarians dying. Many civilians, women, children, that the only thing they did was trying to get close by to somewhere that they were giving them flour or bread. This is not anymore about the seven men and women of World Central Kitchen that perish on this unfortunate event. This is happening way for too long. It's been six months of targeting anything that seems moves. This doesn't seem a war against terror. This doesn't seem anymore a war about defending Israel. This really, at this point, seems it's a war against humanity itself. That's why, yes, I'm requesting Israel, I'm requesting Prime Minister, I'm requesting IDF, that this investigation and many others should be done right, should be done in an independent way. So not only for World Central Kitchen family, for the families of the deceased, but for every other NGO that has been targeted or has lost members to exactly understand how the IDF has been operating so IDF can learn from it. We can all learn from it. Jose, you said earlier this week in an interview, we were targeted deliberately nonstop until everybody was dead in this convoy. Do you believe at this point, from what you have seen, that they were deliberately targeted, your aid group? That the convoy was deliberately attacked is obvious. Uh, the precision, uh, 
the continuous following over 1.8 kilometers until the three cars were totally uh, destroyed and all the members inside those three. Obviously, this was uh, a targeted. We could argue that the first one, let's say, was a mistake. The second, the third. Do you believe World Central Kitchen was targeted uh, on purpose? I, uh, my humanity tells me that obviously I don't want to believe that World Central Kitchen was targeted. And, and probably this was not the case. Because of sure they knew our movements, of sure they knew uh, our teams, of sure they were in direct contact um, with the different people that coordinate uh, in these situations. But obviously this seems keeps happening. This breaking of communications keeps happening. Civilians must be protected. Humanitarian organizations must be protected. There are people that have names and last names. There are people that matter. They cannot be voiceless. They cannot be ghosts of wars that don't make sense. Obviously, IDF has a lot of questions to ask themselves. What exactly are they there for? Are they there really to bring home safely all those hostages that they still are suffering? Of sure, Israel had the right to defend itself. Of sure, what happened to on October 7th to Israel is something should never happen. That was an atrocity. So it's hard to argue with what Jose Andres is saying in uh, most of that clip. And uh, also uh, kudos to him for bringing up the wider uh, attack on aid workers. There are a lot of aid workers that have been killed, not just these seven. And if I were to have any criticism of ABC and uh, the rest of the corporate media, but ABC is platforming Jose Andres, well, uh, you don't really see a lot of platforming of the other aid workers or the groups they work for. Uh, you didn't see a lot of coverage of the aid workers and uh, the journalists and uh, the civilians. They, I mean, they do get mentioned in you know in the news summaries they uh, talked about the number of deaths and uh they did do some reporting on it but not really such an in-depth look at the you know the tactical situation that uh jose andres was talking about with the uh, israeli military and uh what they're doing and uh that actually was also brought up over on uh, CBS News's Face the Nation, Margaret Brennan had on the communications strategist for Biden's National Security Council, John Kirby, and he was on a couple of the shows, and I think Margaret Brennan did the best job of uh, cross-examining him about Israeli violation of international law and about all of the aid workers who have been killed, not just uh, these latest seven, and there's a particularly uh, insightful or, criti or critical clip from the head of Doctors Without Borders uh, talking about that, and that gets platformed here by CBS. So in some ways, that might be better than what ABC did and uh, Martha Raddatz platforming celebrity chef Jose Andres. Uh, I don't know. You can let me... Let me know what you think in the comments section as we uh, juxtapose that interview clip with what Margaret Brennan did with John Kirby over here. You know there has been a large amount of criticism and skepticism as to how Israel is waging this war in the wake of the deaths of those seven humanitarians this past week. Yes. You said on Tuesday the U.S. has not found any incidents where the Israelis have violated international law. How far-reaching is the U.S. investigation of Israel? I wouldn't call it a U.S. investigation of Israel. We have a normal process the State Department uh, runs and governs where they take a look at 
uh, incidents, particularly those that are being con uh, operations being conducted by partner countries. And they look at them and they assess them uh, against international law. And they're doing that in real time, uh, Margaret. So some of them they've, they've looked at and concluded, some they're still looking at. So they may be in violation of international law. Thus far, law. thus far, as I said the other day, we've not seen any indication that they have violated international humanitarian law. But we take this seriously. They take it seriously at the State Department. And we'll keep looking at this. Well, the Secretary General of Doctors Without Borders uh, rejected Israel's explanation of what happened in that World Central Kitchen attack. Yeah. Because he, he lost staff in Gaza, as have other humanitarians, more than 200 dead to date. Take a listen. We do not accept it because what has happened to World Central Kitchen and MSF's convoys and shelters is part of the same pattern of deliberate attacks on humanitarians, health workers, journalists, UN personnel, schools and homes. This is not just about implementing an effective deconflection mechanism. Our movements and locations are shared, coordinated and identified already. This is about impunity, a total disregard for the laws of war, and now it must become about accountability. This isn't a mistake, he says. This is a deliberate pattern, and he is not the only aid organization to say so. Well, we certainly Will understand. there be accountability? We understand the frustration that they have. We share that frustration, and there have been too many aid workers killed by Israeli operations, and that is why the president was so firm with Prime Minister Netanyahu in their call this week about they've got to change the way they're doing this. And the deconfliction process does matter, because there is already communication between aid workers and, and the IDF. It's pointless. It's clearly not working. This, clearly, it's clearly failing. Clearly this broke down. No question about it. We're not arguing that it hasn't. We're, our, our case to the Israelis is you got to do more. You got to do it better. It's got to improve. It's because we've already seen some aid organizations now pulling back, not just World Central Kitchen, but others. Uh, this is a time when the people of Gaza need food, water, medicine, fuel right. more than any. But so, the president's own national security memorandum stipulates, as you know, that there can't be an impediment to delivery of aid. So is negligence, gross negligence, failure to communicate, failure to follow through to protect these aid workers a violation? Is there any certainly, accountability? Certainly those things are not acceptable. And again, that was the, the tenor and the tone of the conversation that Prime Minister, I'm sorry, the President had with the Prime Minister. They have taken some measures of accountability here in the immediate wake of the of the World Central Kitchen. Two uh, soldiers. Uh, two, two were fired. Uh, we're going to be looking to see, well, first of all, we're going through the investigation ourselves right now. We want to reserve judgment until we've had a chance to look at their findings. And we certainly expect, and this is an important point, that the announcements the Israelis have made, while welcome and important, can't be the end of it. Mm -hmm. We've got to see sustained changes in the way they're operating on the ground and the way they are allowing humanitarian assistance to get in unmolested. And so, yeah, I'm sorry. I was just looking at the transcript here because um, uh, the uh, I thought that was probably the best clip there. She brought up the uh, the hundreds of aid workers that have been killed showing the clip from the general secretary of doctors without borders and uh got john kirby at least to admit oh too many aid workers have been killed yeah that's true and i think that clip from the general secretary of doctors without borders is also uh important but um the i'm looking at the transcript of uh, what oh here it is um about the the what the uh biden administration their uh national security memo i, I want to get the wording exactly what uh the president's own national security memorandum stipulates that there can't be an impediment to delivery of aid there can't be an impediment to delivery of aid, but, and, you know, that's a violation. That's a, a humanitarian violation of U.S. policy and uh, should have consequences. And Margaret Brennan asks about that, this uh, national security memorandum, that there can't be an impediment to delivery of aid. But there's like nothing but impediment to delivery of aid from Israel for the last six months of this conflict. And... Uh, the 
interview with Cindy McCain from the World Food Pro Program talks about that, although some of the problems are kind of logistical, but they're definitely impediments to the delivery of aid uh, that are also explicated in Jake Tapper's interview with Cindy McCain over in this clip. Israel is set to open a new humanitarian passage into Gaza after that horrific attack that killed seven aid workers from World Central Kitchen. It's a move that has threatened to slow the already meager flow of aid into the devastated region. And joining us now is the executive director of the World Food Program, Cindy McCain. Uh, Cindy, Ambassador McCain, good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Israel has already also op uh, proved opening the Eretz crossing from Israel into northern Gaza to get this desperately needed aid in. How important is opening that crossing for you and your wor workers with the World Food Program? Um, will that help hold off this famine that you, you've said is imminent? There are two entrances. It's Eretz and Ford. And all of that is very important. We need to get food at scale up north. Uh, but, but with that said, uh, we have to make sure that we continue to get not trucks just in up the, the fence road, but up the beach road, but also through the, very, the various entrances. We need more, though. Uh, this just isn't enough. And, and as you know, we're literally on the brink of going over the edge, over the cliff with famine and not being able to recover from it. So Secretary Blinken praised the move by Netanyahu to open Eretz Crossing, but he said, quote, the real test is results. Uh, when do you expect your trucks uh, will be able to move through the Eretz Crossing? Have you seen any tangible evidence yet on the ground that more aid is going to get in? Well, there are certainly meetings that have been had, and I'm aware of some of them, and, and I know that there's plenty more going on right now. Uh, please remember this, though, and so our viewers understand, WFP stands ready. We have right now amassed outside on the border food for 1.1 million people for three months. We just need to get it in. That's why these crossings are so important, and more crossings are needed, as you know. You've been sounding the alarm about this crisis, um, especially in northern Gaza, for months now. Why do you think there has been such a holdup getting the aid into Gaza? Is it because of security concerns that weapons might be smuggled in? Is it punitive because the October 7th attacks were so horrific? The hostages still remain in Gaza. What is the reason for the blockade as it's been? Well, from our experience, uh, we've just had difficulties getting through the checkpoints. The Israeli, uh, de uh, it, the, when the Israelis take a look at the trucks and x-ray them, that's done in a very efficient and effective manner. Um, it's just once we get in, and it, and many times, uh, th either the right foot's not talking to the left foot, or, you know, it just, it just depends. And of course, you've seen the examples of when we were looted very heavily. People are desperate, and you and I both know you would do anything to feed your children. So, so we have to remember this is a it, this is an insane uh, thing that's going on, and it's and it's something that that we as humanitarians must be able to get in with our humanitarian principles and deliver aid in such a way. So, yeah, I thought that was also a pretty good clip about uh, the aid situation and some of the impediments to aid. And remember, uh, if. Israel is putting up impediments to aid. That's a violation of the humanitarian principles in that national security memorandum that uh, was talked about by Margaret Brennan in the previous clip. Um, oh, I also uh, saw I got a super chat contribution I, uh, from uh, Kay Tiff, if that, I'm pronouncing that right. At what point do repeating mistakes become willful malice? Well, uh, Willful malice, uh, that, I mean, that's kind of a, a legal willfulness, at least, is a, a legal type of intention. And you saw that uh, Margaret Brennan was bringing up, like, negligence, gross negligence. I mean, uh, that, I mean that's the question. And one of the things that will answer, uh, Katif, your question there, if, sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, is... Uh, in this investigation of what happened to the seven World Central Kitchen workers, Israel should provide their drone video, right? And if the drone, the drone video, I find it hard to believe that Israeli drones, even if it's dark out, can't see the the big logo on the top of the car, especially when like the picture that they uh, kept showing, I think it was even in the ABC. Here, let me see real quick if I can 
find that uh, screenshot here. Uh, the ABC news summary at the beginning of the program when they talked about the strike on the world central kitchen. Did they show that like photo of the missile that like went right through the logo? Um, I'm like sort of scanning through that video here. I'm trying to find a screenshot. Of, no, I, they didn't. But if you watch coverage of this, like one of the drone strikes, like put a big hole right in the middle of the world central kitchen logo, which makes me think they could see the logo, but yeah, I guess you have to see the drone video to know for sure. But, um, I do appreciate that super chat contribution. It's actually been a while since I've gotten one during one of my live streams, but, uh, I do have, uh, one more clip I want to show you. Uh, one more newsmaker clip before I get to the bonus Cheech and Chong the Cats clip. Uh, but this is the clip I promised you at the beginning. It's the one mention of World Central Kitchen in the entire Fox News Sunday episode. You saw in their news summary they mentioned like seven aid workers, one of whom was an American, but they tried to like scrub out the celebrity aspect and remember in the news summary when they talked about it they immediately mentioned how well remember in afghanistan the biden administration mistakenly killed 10 civilians so you know killing civilians is just a thing uh <laughs> which is the worst kind of whataboutism and uh but that's martha mccallum the host uh actually is following up on a whole different discussion they're having on fox news sunday with this weird like SAT answer, you know, the A is to B as C is to D questions on, I don't know, do they still have those on the SATs? I took the SATs a really long time ago, but apparently like uh, ISIS is to the United States as Hamas is to Israel, which uh, was something one of the other panelists said right before this clip and Martha McAllen picks up on it. It's kind of a stupid argument because, uh, the United States isn't, uh, you know, ISIS actually sprung to life when the United States pulled out of Iraq. So the United States was not occupying uh, the Middle East or the parts of the Middle East where ISIS, you know, it was, it started in Iraq and Syria where the United States didn't have any troops at the time. While Hamas, of course, is in Gaza, which, you know, I guess Israel doesn't occupy like they occupy the west bank but uh it's definitely like i've heard some people refer to it as like an open air prison uh because they're totally surrounded and uh all of the imports and exports are controlled you know all the border crossings are controlled by israel and uh there there are a whole bunch of other strictures on it so it it's not exactly an occupation in gaza but it's definitely uh, an oppressive situation and it's also one where Israel was uh, secretly supporting Hamas. Netanyahu gave all sorts of money to Hamas over the years. I talked about this months ago when this first happened where you know I like I said earlier I hope nobody's a fan of Hamas. Their Hamas is terrible and they were terrible they were a terrible government in Gaza but in some ways uh, Netanyahu wanted that terrible government in Gaza because he doesn't want the two-state solution and he didn't want to have anyone to negotiate with who was reasonable so he helped like prop up the terrible government in Gaza Hamas uh, at the expense of peace and at the expense of the future of the Palestinian people so uh, wait I'm going off on a big long tangent here uh, but that's why <laughs> ISIS is to the United States as Hamas is to Israel is a bogus beginning to this clip. That's how I got off on this whole tangent. And then Juan Williams uh, is the one person on the left on the panel, and he's the only person to say the words world central kitchen in this whole episode, tries to make an argument, and furiously gets pushed back from the supposedly straight news anchor Martha McCallum. <laughs> over in this clip. It's a great point, Juan. Um, I, you know, as Roger just said, ISIS is to America as Hamas is to Israel. And really, there's only one outcome of that. And that was, in our minds, the eradication of ISIS and the elimination of that terror group and victory. We're not hearing the president talking about victory for Israel. 
I think we are hearing this week the president talking about Israel, you know, sadly killing those people from World Central Kitchen. Uh, and the man who was the head of that, the celebrity chef, Jose Andres, saying Israel didn't do this as just a, you know, consequence of war, but it was tactical and intentional. And I think the president, from all we've heard in terms of reporting, was outraged by that murder. Why wasn't the president outraged when we took out 10 people on the withdrawal from Afghanistan who uh, he were was, aid workers, including seven clear. children? There was no, no one was ever reprimanded for that That's or fired. Not, look, I think everybody, I think we've had con generals testify on Capitol Hill just recently about how that was an error. But I think that what we're seeing on the ground in Israel is the president saying, listen, what we're seeing in, going on in Gaza is really regrettable. People are calling it, you know, a massacre of people and innocents, people who are not involved with Hamas. And you've got to do a better job of protecting not only innocent people, you, I mean, it really is heartbreaking to think about children dying, but also people who are humanitarian aid workers. And that's why the president is saying, let's get a deal that involves release of hostages and a ceasefire. And this week was the first time you heard the word ceasefire come from this White House, because this White House is squarely behind Israel. But Netanyahu and his tactics are clearly seeding Israel's standing in the globe. It's not just the United States. Israel has always been a paradigm of human rights, you know, given what the well, Jewish Israel community went through. Israel has dropped leaflets. They have sent warnings every time they're, they're going just, after buildings. It is, war is horrific, and right. no one wants have to see deaths on either images? side, including what started with the Hamas invasion. Have you seen those images of, of the devastation of Gaza? Oh, no, I, I, I have. I've Katie, I want to get you in I've here. Also seen <laughs> and Juan Williams did not get any support from anyone else on the panel. I, and never mind the supposedly straight news anchor Martha McCallum there. And uh, like I said, that was the only time the words uh, World Central Kitchen were mentioned in the entire episode. And uh, you saw the um, the immediate pushback and the use of this weird talking point. Well, the Biden administration killed 10 civilians in Afghanistan, so killing civilians is good, right? Or uh, I don't even know what that argument's supposed to be. But it's just, uh, I believe that's called a red herring or uh, whataboutism, like I said earlier. But anyway, uh, those are the nine clips I picked out from the Sunday morning news analysis shows for you. Well, one was from Saturday Night Live. Uh, the other eight were from the four of the big five corporate outlets that actually broadcast on Sunday. Because if it's Sunday, it's not necessarily meet the press. Remember that. And I bet next week, uh, just like last week, Kristen Welker, like uh, Chuck Todd before her, will be back at the end of the program saying, if it's Sunday, it's meet the press. And how can she even say that like one week after they were preempted by soccer? But anyway, I don't know why this upsets me so much, but it's, I'm going to stop on that. And oh, there are kittens walking around or adolescent cats at this point i guess i well i often refer to cats as kittens anyway but i do have a bonus kitten clip then for you cheech and chong uh, earlier today i got some muse in this clip and you know i sometimes i've had uh chong is a does a lot of really loud purrs and i've tried to hold him up to the microphone but i have this microphone set for voice isolation and it doesn't pick up purrs but uh Fortunately, today, because as you've seen in some previous uh, clips at the end of the live streams, uh, Chong really loves walking right up to the camera, and he also purrs like you don't have to pet him to get he he purrs like when you look at him sometimes or when he's coming near you. So uh, I think my iPhone that was uh, taking this video of Cheech and Chong earlier today not only got some like cute muse, but some very strong purrs as Chong walks up to the camera at the end in my bonus clip to finish the show over here. Oh, oh, sorry, wrong click, but thanks again, Katif, for that super chat contribution. Now, here's the bonus clip at the end. Uh, 
Yeah, I actually, uh, having watched that clip with my little earpiece in, I noticed you can hear Chong purring through the whole clip because it, it actually, when he yawns, uh, he does this weird yawn a lot of the time, or when uh, the purring stops briefly when he yawns. Go back and watch it again. You can hear the pull. The he's he's purring for the entire clip. It just gets louder when he comes up to the camera at the end. But anyway, that's the bonus. Uh, Cheech and Chong the Kitten Clip to finish the show. I hope you appreciated the time and effort I put into making this video, putting together all the clips, and adding my media criticism and political commentary. I will be back doing this every Monday uh, through uh, January 2025, when I will probably transition into other kinds of videos. But uh, next week, I'll be back on Monday, April 15th, which... Uh, apparently is going to be the beginning of jury selection in Trump's first criminal trial in New York for falsifying business, business records to cover up uh, the hush money payments he paid to uh, Stormy Daniels and uh, this other woman, too. I think through uh, there was this whole uh, National Enquirer catch and kill thing, and I'm really looking forward to covering that. I did a video about it when uh, the felony charges were first came out and uh i think this trial has actually been kind of underestimated by the pundits especially on fox news they uh say say it's bogus and political and they turned a misdemeanor into a felony and no one other than donald trump would be prosecuted but uh i mean michael cohen pled guilty to a lot of the same facts uh that are in this indictment and uh and he said in his plea under oath that he was directed to do it by donald trump so why shouldn't the person who directed him to commit the felony also be charged with the felony i don't know why it didn't come out in the federal co i'm going off on a big long tangent about what i'm going to be covering next week but uh it's a good reason to show up and watch the show next week uh, hopefully they'll at least be doing jury selection and I actually have done uh, about a dozen jury trials and did a bunch of jury selection and uh, know something about it. So I may have some good insights to contribute. So until next Monday or until I have some other reason to upload a video, I guess I'll be seeing all of you around the Internet.